Mahum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tilamane Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pachari Nene Visesa Sunyavari Paschatya Desatari Nene Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai So We're going to continue reading about yoga maya and um i was thinking not to have kirtan today because i i have to give another class i have to do another kirtan and i have a sore throat slightly so i thought we could hold off on that but i found something interesting to read i have to find it, which will also give some time for devotees to get online. This is this is um, commentary from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur on the 10th canto in he has something to say about Maya, Yoga Maya. The only problem is I didn't note the exact place. So, but that will give time for all of you to come. And you have to excuse me, I read this this morning and I didn't note it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let me read something. <laughs> this may not be it, but we'll read something of interest. Hmm. 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 I am not sure. Yeah. Okay. Let me read this. There's a few things. Conjunction of material and spiritual in Krishna's pastimes is there to illustrate the methodological nature of bhakti. While devotees perform sadhana bhakti in the form of hearing and chanting about Krishna, they also enjoy the six material sense objects, which is a secondary effect of bhakti. At that time, the devotee cries out pitifully, O oh Krishna, because of this enjoyment, I will fall into the dark well of material existence. In other words, if you're not a devotee and you get material enjoyment, you're very happy. But if you are a devotee and you get material enjoyment, you're very afraid of it. So there may be some opulences that come with bhakti. Krishna takes care of his devotees and a devotee is afraid of that, actually doesn't want it. When a devotee shows fear of material, a material enjoyment, gradually the tendency to enjoy matter subsides. So what's the fear? As stated, as we just read, O oh Krishna, because of this enjoyment, I will fall into the dark well of material material existence. So the devotee fears, is concerned. We could say at least concerned. When a devotee shows fear of material, material enjoyment, gradually the tendency to enjoy matter subsides. Then bhakti in the form of hearing and chanting Krishna's name, glorifying his transcendental forms, qualities, and pastimes, 
and serving the Lord in various ways becomes prominent. Finally, Krishna himself, the ocean of all wonderful forms and qualities, appears within the devotee. So, they, as, as you know in the story, Balaram appeared in the womb, and Balaram manifested different paraphernalia in Krishna's Leela. So he actually manifested a bed and a throne and everything so he could nicely be situated in the womb. And the six sons of Devaki that were killed, which represent the six kinds of material contamination, also represent the six senses and sense gratification. So when that's killed, when sense gratification is killed, then Krishna can sit within the heart. That, that's the idea. And because that's true, the devotee, therefore, doesn't want sense gratification because the devotee sees sense gratification as the enemy, not as the friend, which is interesting. And, and why is that? Because if a devotee feels satisfied in material existence. We should feel satisfied in spiritual existence. But if we feel satisfied in material existence, that's very harmful for our bhakti. Or a Prabhupada says that's, that's the enemy. So people want to be happy, and people say the, the goal of life is to be happy. And Prabhupada is saying, if you're happy outside of Krishna consciousness, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. If something outside of Krishna consciousness is enjoyable, now what is being said here by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, well, there's no room for Krishna to enter. So it's when um, a devotee gives up any uh, personal desire. And so why would a devotee shun sense gratification? Well, there's two reasons. The reason we're discussing now, because it doesn't make room for Krishna. And, of course, the other reason is is that it's not attractive. But I just thought it's an interesting perspective. If sense gratification comes, the devotees praying, Krishna, um, please help me so I don't give in to these desires. Now, I don't know if that's what I actually wanted to read to you. But I found that interesting, so I read it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Let's continue reading. Since Devaki possesses the power to make the Lord appear, she can be considered the incarnation of bhakti. Hmm. Kamsa can be considered the incarnation of fear, as it is often said, out of fear of Kamsa. Just as fear of the material world removes the six sense objects from the womb of Bhakti, so Kamsa destroyed the six children of Devaki. Krishna Prema, which is characterized by intense service to the Lord, necessarily appears in the womb of Bhakti after the desire for sense objects is extinguished. Similarly, Ananta, the personified form of service to the Lord, appeared as the seventh child of Devaki. As Sri Krishna appears himself after Prema Bhakti appears, so Bhagavan appeared as the eighth child of Devaki. So, hmm. just reaffirming what we just said, um, so if anyone ever says or you ever think well what's wrong with sense gratification doesn't Krishna want me to enjoy this world to be happy in this world the answer is when you want Krishna to appear. If you want Krishna to appear, then you have to eliminate 
your personal desires, and then you've created the home and your heart for him, and then Krishna can appear. So that's the problem with sense gratification. Okay, hold on, everyone. We're going to re remove this beautiful prop from your vision so it doesn't spoil your vision. That is a... That reflects light. If you put light at it, it reflects back. It's for photography or videos. So... Um, What's wrong with sense gratification? It seems innocent. And in fact, as you may well know, in other religions, sense gratification is it's glorified. God gave me this, gave me a new car, gave me a new job, I have more money. And so we should be careful to not glorify sense gratification. And I think sometimes we glorify Krishna by glorifying the sense gratification that we got, isn't it? Krishna is so kind, he gave me this beautiful house and it's so nice and it's so enjoyable. Well, that's not, that is, yes, you could say is a manifestation of Krishna's kindness, but if um, it's not the highest manifestation. <laughs> so, um, we really shouldn't glorify Krishna for giving us sense gratification. Although we know all, everything that comes to us is his mercy. So it's not that we don't recognize it. But I just found this very interesting. That when there is no desire for sense gratification, then we can say, Krishna has been very merciful upon me. He's removed any desire to enjoy separately from him. That is a manifestation of Krishna's mercy, truly and fully and wholly. And if, you know, Krishna may give you sense gratification, but it, it may be something you wanted, it may be karmically endowed to you. It, it, in any case, Krishna gives us everything and we understand that everything is coming from him. But we shouldn't be in this mood of glorifying sense grat glorifying Krishna for giving us sense gratification. That's you might glorify him for taking it away if you feel it was helpful or you needed it. That we would do that. And I know maybe that sounds strange to some people. You're glorifying God for taking sense gratification away. Well, that's what the Bhagavatam says. That's his mercy. When he's merciful, that's what he does. Hmm. If you were in a situation where you were tempted, being very much tempted by something which would be very bad for you to do, for your Krishna consciousness, you would have probably prayed, Krishna, please, Help me control myself. And the thing you wanted to do was materially very enjoyable, but you understood it would be very bad for your Krishna consciousness. How is Krishna going to sit in the heart of someone who hasn't been able to control his senses? So that's what I wanted to read. I think that's what I wanted to read. Anyway... If there was something else that I wanted to read, I'm not able to find it. Mm. Anyway, so we're going to continue reading from our document about Yoga Maya. We don't have much more to read. There's not a lot left. I was thinking that we're soon going to be going into a new topic. And if you, I have an idea of a new topic. It, it may be, what's today, Wednesday? It may take us 
Depending how many questions and discussions there are, it may take us a few more days to finish. Maybe up to a week. And then I was thinking, perhaps we may, we may want to go into the topic of the mind. Interesting topic, isn't it? Uh, unless you have some other suggestions. So let's begin. This is from the Adi Lila, chapter 5, text 41. Although the Supreme Personality of God it has nothing to do, he nevertheless acts. Although he is always unborn, he nevertheless takes birth. Although he is time, fearful to everyone, he flees Mathura in fear of his enemy to take shelter in a fort. This is Krishna leaving Mathura for Dwarka because so many demons were coming to kill him. And although he is self-sufficient, he marries 16,000 women. These pastimes seem like bewildering contradictions, even to the most intelligent. Had these activities of the Lord not been a reality, sages would not have been puzzled by them. Therefore, such activities should never be considered imaginary. Whenever the Lord desires, his inconceivable energy, Yoga Maya, serves him in creating and performing such pastimes. So you may know that there's a prayer by Queen Kunti, and she expressed the same thing. That it, you are feared by fear of personified, but you're running in fear of Mother Yasoda. This is bewildering. This is like supreme contradiction. And what's being said here in Chaitanya Charitamrita, this is all the arrangement of Yoga Maya. So, um, you take birth although you're birthless. Contradiction, right? You've, you're running from your mother. You're running to Dwarka, and afraid of Jarsand and others. Um, you are, and this this comes up a lot. Why is Krishna so attached? to enjoyment with the gopis when he is self-sufficient, atmarama. The, the sadhu, the self-realized soul, is self-sufficient. So what to speak of Krishna? And then Krishna's looking, oh, where's Radha? I want to meet Radha. He's calling the gopis. That's also a contradiction, isn't it? Why would he need anyone? Why would he need you? Why would he need me? And hundreds and hundreds of times we read and we hear that Krishna is controlled by his devotees, that he's anxious to be with his devotees. When he's in Dwarka, Krishna is thinking and dreaming about the Brajbasis, especially the gopis. The self-sufficient Supreme Personality of Godhead is hankering after the association of the gopis. This seems to be a contradiction. He's moving to Dwarka afraid of all these demons. But he kills them all, So, but he's afraid. It seems to be a contradiction, doesn't it? So uh, the reason I put this in is just to show that yoga maya potency can create these apparent contradictions, and they all have, they all have their place in the lila, right? So what happens when Krishna is running in fear of Mother Yasoda? What happens when you hear about that? Or if you're fortunate enough to see it, what happens? You become more attached to Krishna. That's what happens. You become, it increases your affection. So that's why Krishna does it. Do the gopis want to dance with Krishna? Yes, of course. Krishna's motive is, Krishna's motive is to enjoy. We say that. He he we I think we read yesterday or we mentioned yesterday, excuse me, Monday, that when Krishna calls the gopis to dance, he calls them or no, when Krishna steals the gopis' clothes, he does it because it makes him happy. But there's also another purpose. Why is it making Krishna happy? Because it's making the devotees happy, because Krishna knows these women want me as their husband. If I steal their clothes, 
and they appear before me without clothes, I have to marry them. So, when, when Krishna does something and you're confused, why did he do this? It doesn't make sense or it seems immoral or whatever. Um, just go back to this principle. He did this for the pleasure of, of his devotees. That's why he did it. And that will answer all these contradictions. And you're running to Dwarka to protect the devotees. And you're afraid of Mother Yasoda to inspire the devotees with this Leela. What's the other one? Um, you take birth. Wow! You're birthless, but you take birth. In Goloka Vrindavan, Krishna does not take birth. There's no baby Krishna. And it's said that his pastimes as a baby are some of the sweetest pastimes ever. And those sweet pastimes only take place in this world. So he takes birth like an ordinary child. And what did Jashoda think? This is my ordinary child. So she was able to relish those pastimes. All the gopis in Braj were able to relish these pastimes of Krishna growing up. So that's why he did it. It's the answer for everything. So when anyone ever asks you, why? Why? Does Krishna do Why did he do that? Why does he do this? Why does he? Now you know the answer. It's like the panacea answer. Of course it's for his enjoyment, but his enjoyment is never independent of what gives his devotees pleasure. So now we're, we're reading from Adi Lila 13, chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 86. So this is how Krishna appeared. This is how Krishna appeared in the so-called womb of Devaki. It wasn't actually the womb. We say the womb, but not actually. The incarnation of the Lord entered the mind of Vasudev and was then transferred to the mind of Devaki. Transferred to the mind of Devaki. This is really interesting. And so Vasudev is thinking of Krishna and Krishna enters his mind. And he became effulgent. You know, sometimes you you only hear that. Devaki became effulgent. Vasudev became effulgent also. Did you know that? So if you're thinking of Krishna, you're meditating on Krishna, Krishna's there. I mean, if we're deeply meditating on Krishna, people will look at us and say, look at so-and-so. She's effulgent. He's effulgent. Sometimes people said that about Prabhupada. He's effulgent. He's shining. Uh, the story of Dhruva Maharaj he was meditating on Krishna. Krishna was with him, and he became as heavy as the universe. I don't know if you ever felt that way or meditated on that when you're chanting Japa, that Krishna's here is right now. I, I, I should be weighing down the whole universe. So I sh the lights are off in my room, but I should be lighting it up if Krishna's actually here. It's a nice meditation. You know, or, and, and I'm sure you're lighting things up a little bit, Maybe not noticeably, but if Krishna is actually in your heart, things will light up. Srila, Srila Sridhar Swami gives the following annotation in this connection. Mama Avivesha Manashavir Babhuva Jivanam Ivana Datu Sambandha Ityartaha There was no question of the seminal discharge necessary for the birth of an ordinary human being. Srila Rupa Goswami also comments in this connection that Lord Krishna first appeared in the mind of Anaka Dundubi, Basudev, that's Basudev's name, another name, and was then transferred to the mind of Devaki Devi. Thus, the spiritual bliss in the mind of Devaki Devi gradually increased, just as the moon increases every night until it becomes a full moon. So now, 
through the mind, Krishna, it's like the mind of uh, in samadhi. Now Krishna is transferred into the mind, the heart of Devaki. That's samadhi, basically. <clears throat> if you can get Krishna in your heart and keep him there, you're doing good. Of course, the only way really to do that is to love him. Because without love, you can't really keep anything in your heart. Hmm. So now, um, so it said her spiritual bliss is increasing day by day because that's the, the dynamic nature of spiritual life. You never hit a point where, sorry, that's it. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. Sometimes we say that, materially speaking, you do something for the first time and it was the best experience you've ever had and you say it doesn't get be any better than this. It was like the best song you ever heard, the best movie, the best restaurant, the best whatever. And then so there's that expression. <clears throat> Not true in the spiritual world. It does get better than this. Just at that point, when you think it can't get any better, it gets better. Sound good? Yeah, I think it sounds good. Sign me up for that one. I'll take that. It sounds really good. Imagine hearing your favorite song ever. You know, sometimes they interview people and say, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite this? What's your favorite place? And so imagine all those favorite things got better. It's hard to imagine, right? You know, your favorite food. It's like you practically faint when you eat it. And imagine it gets better. Forever gets better. Never stops getting better. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's nice to imagine it because here in this world we're we're basically chewing the chewed and Krishna's offering us something where it gets better eternally. It's reverse chewing gum. You know, chewing gum, you know, it's good in the beginning. But after a while it's just it's the flavor is gone. It's like it's chewed out. Sorry, fun's over. Imagine chewing gum they got better. The more you chew, the better it gets. And it eternally gets better. Hard to imagine. We don't have that experience. Meditate on that when you're tempted or you're having difficulty controlling yourself. Meditate that uh, I am, by this enjoyment, I am perpetuating my existence in the material world by which I lose out on the enjoyment of this ever-increasing transcendental bliss. Something to meditate on, isn't it? Like, this is what I'm being offered. Yeah, so sometimes we have difficulty in Krishna consciousness and then someone will talk to a devotee who's not having difficulty and say, you know, it seems like you don't have difficulty. What's your secret? And I'll say, well, I do have difficulty, but I, I keep pushing through. And the difficulties become easier to deal with as I advance in Krishna consciousness, and then they gradually go away. But what is that What is that thing that's pushing you, even when it's difficult and you just want to give up? And for sure, this is one of the things. Well, I am on the brink of becoming, again, reinstating myself as an eternal servant of Krishna. And um, how could I turn away from that offer? It doesn't make any sense. The, <clears throat> the alternative is really bad. And so the problem is the alternative looks good if you don't... The alternative, meaning material life, it looks good if you're not focused on and understanding deeply what the spiritual alternative is, or you just forget. <clears throat> but if you remember the spiritual alternative, you can't give up Krishna consciousness. It just doesn't, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, ever, ever, ever. <clears throat> Correct? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, I have to take some more. I woke up with a sore throat the other day. And often when you get a sore throat, it's foreshadowing of a cold or something, but 
going to the temple every morning, it's been like freezing, literally freezing, not just feeling freezing, temperature is freezing. I think maybe I got something from doing that. It's been really cold here. Come to Florida. You can go skiing. You can go skiing at four in the morning down your lawn because it's all full of ice. At the time of his appearance, Lord Krishna came out of the mind of Devaki and appeared within the prison house of Kamsa by the side of Devaki's bed. So whenever the word womb is used, it means her mind or her heart. That's where Krishna was situated. That's where he came out. He didn't come out of the womb like an ordinary birth. Just kind of, there he is. That was easy. At that time, by the smell, not by the smell, by the spell of Yoga Maya, Devaki, Deva, Devaki thought that her child had now been born. In other words, she thought it was like a regular birth. In this connection, she didn't really see what was happening exactly. She thought she gave birth. It appears that she thought this was like a normal birth. Yoga Maya had put her in a spell. In this connection, even the demigods from the celestial kingdom were also bewildered. Wow. As it is stated, muyanti yat surayaha. That's from the first verse of Bhagavatam. And that means that the demigods, even the demigods are bewildered about Krishna's position. They came, the demigods came to offer their prayers to Devaki, thinking that the Supreme Lord was within, within her womb. The demigods came to Mathura from their celestial kingdom. This indicates that Mathura is still more important than the celestial kingdom of the upper planetary systems. Yeah, so if you can join Krishna Leela, that doesn't get any better. And it gets eternally better than it doesn't get any better. Krishna Leela doesn't get any better than this, and it eternally gets better than this. Another contradiction. So, um, so Yoga Maya also, as you remember, Subhadra was born of Jashoda, but Yoga Maya came and she didn't know what was happening. She didn't know if she had a boy or a girl, and she wakes up and there's Krishna. She didn't know. That was Yoga Maya. Uh, so there's a verse. I think we've discussed this before. It said, everyone in the material world is bewildered, either by Yoga Maya or Mahamaya. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be bewildered by something. Better be bewildered by Yoga Maya than by Mahamaya. Okay. Let me read one more thing, and then I'll see if you have any comments. This is from Madhya Leela 21-104. Madhya simply means middle, Adi means beginning, and Antya means end. So the beginning pastimes, middle pastimes, and end. Also, you, you often hear this kanishta, Madhyam and Uttama. He's a Kanishta Bhakta. A hey, Kanishta, get out of my house. Madhyam. Kanishta means beginning or lower. You know, you have three levels lower, middle, and higher. So Kanishta means lower, Madhya means middle, and Uttama means higher. So sometimes it refers to devotees, sometimes it refers to qualifications that we have for pure devotional service. I have a Kanishta qualification, I have a Madhyam qualification, I have a Uttama, I have a low, middle, or high qualification. So it's it's not just he's an Uttama Adhikari, Uttama Bhakta. Uttama Adhikari means he has the highest qualification to be a pure devotee. Uttama Bhakta means he is a pure devotee. Sometimes that's misunderstood, but it's not some esoteric classification only for a devotee. It just means 
lower, middle, and higher. And Adi, Madhyaman, Ancha means beginning, middle, and end. Just a little lesson in Sanskrit for you. Actually, as again, we said Madhyam 21, Madhyalila 21, chapter 21, text 104. Actually, the activities of Yoga Maya are present, excuse me, this is interesting. Actually, the activities of Yoga Maya are absent in the spiritual sky. Hmm. Hmm. Did you hear that, Prabhu? Yoga Maya is absent in the spiritual sky. What does that mean? I found this statement interesting. Actually, the activities of Yoga Maya are absent in the spiritual sky and the Vaikuntha planets. Hmm. It's a Sherlock Holmes moment, if I ever had one. You ever, you ever read something in Prabhupada's books and you like reread it and you're like, really? I didn't know that. It's a Sherlock Holmes mo moment. You like find something. No, but I read this book 468 times, but I missed this sentence. That's a Sherlock Holmes moment. Actually, the activities of Yoga Maya are absent in the spiritual sky and the Vaikuntha planets. She simply works in the supreme planet Goloka Vrindavan. And she works to manifest the activities of Krishna when he descends to the material universe to please his innumerable devotees within the material world. So she takes birth with Krishna because Krishna needs her for the Leela. So she's there in Goloka Vrindavan and she comes to Gokul Vrindavan. But in Vaikuntha, not necessary. There's no need to cover Narayan's position and um, start playing baseball with him. It's not the mood. Everything is reverential there. So they, in Vaikuntha, they don't need Krishna's position covered. That would create disaster, complete disaster. Vaikuntha is kind of like Britain. Everything is proper. You have to, you know, you have to, when you're in Britain and you're drinking tea, make sure you hold your fingers like this. Right? Proper. You have to do it proper. But when you're in California, it's just, ah, right? So, <laughs> yeah, one devotee did a joke and he, Showing how the British people use napkins, very nice. Yeah, they're very, everything is very... And how in America they just smear their face and in Trinidad they just use their sleeve. So, you know, Vrindavan's something like that. You know, and England's like the proper. So England is... England is Vaikuntha. Something like that. So she's not needed there. Now I've offended all the Brits. They're never going to come to my class again. Okay. So I'm going to read this again because it's worth reading again. Actually, the activities of Yoga Maya are absent in the spiritual sky and the Vaikuntha planets. She simply works in the supreme planet, Goloka Vrindavan, and she works to manifest the activities of Krishna when he descends to the material universe to please his innumerable devotees within the material world. It goes on. We didn't finish. Thus, a replica of Goloka Vrindavan planet and the pastimes there is manifested on this planet on a specific tract of land. Boma Vrindavan, the Vrindavan Dham of this planet. So Boma means earth. You take that planet, Goloka, you transplant it without that having to go anywhere, you manifest it, and here you have Boma Vrindavan with the added advantage that Krishna grows up here and there's demons to kill. It's a bit, gets quite exciting down here. And you have Srimad Bhagavatam, which allows you to enter into those pastimes, to hear and thus enter in those pastimes. And so Yoga Maya 
she's part of the program in this, in Goloka Vrindavan, so she's got to come down here and make sure everything happens properly. But in Vaikuntha, not necessary, because her her position is to cover Krishna's position so that the leelas can go on more beautifully, and also that so that the non devotees they can't really um, break in on the party. They can't understand what's going on. Okay, so I am going to see if you have any comments. I will go back to the beginning. Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Ram Hari. Welcome to all of you. Welcome Parvat, Parvat Muni, the one and only. I met Parvat Muni's 1979. I looked at him and said, you're going to become a devotee. And my prediction worked. Well, now I wonder if I just can go up to anyone and say, you know, you're going to become a devotee. And Krishna says, okay, we have to make him a devotee because Mahatma Das said he's going to become a devotee. Well, I don't realize if I had that uh, potency. Maybe I do. I'll try it out on somebody. I'll try it out today on somebody and see if it works. Can excessive aversion to material enjoyment be a sign of attachment? Definitely, yeah. Those women, get them out of the temple. I hate them. I never want to see them again. They're just destroying my spiritual life. That's how you know that Brahmacharya is going to get married like tomorrow because he's talking like that. Definitely. Um, you know, I lived in the Brahmacharya ashram and that's how we knew who was the next one who was going to get married because they'd be speaking negatively about women. So that's what I say, ladies. If you're going to marry a man who's Coming out of the Brahmacharya Ashram, make sure he goes through a seven-day cleanse of negative women, uh, deprogramming all the negative some scars he has about women. Because that could be one of the reasons he's getting married. I, he's attached to women, but he wants to remain detached. So he tries to say, uh, speak about how bad they are. So aversion is not always a sign of attraction. Excessive aversion generally is a sign because, although it may not be, um, but generally it's a sign if it's too constant and excessive because then you're thinking about, you're always thinking about the thing that you're supposedly not attached to. And generally speaking, if you're not attached to something, you don't think about it. So if you're thinking about it even in aversion, it probably means there's... Okay, even even I say, yeah, I'm detached from women. I don't like women. But I'm always thinking about how much I don't like women. So what am I thinking about? Well, if I'm a brahmachari, one of the rules of brahmachari life is not to think about women. So I'm thinking about how much I don't like women. What am I thinking about? No, Prabhu, but I'm not attached. I'm just thinking about how much I don't like them. Well, if you're not attached, why are you thinking about how much you don't like them? You wouldn't think about them at all. I mean, think of something you don't like. Like, I don't like beets. I don't know why I don't like beets. And my wife doesn't like licorice, and I do, and she loves beets. We can't figure that one out. But I can guarantee you when I go into a grocery store, as soon as I put my foot in the grocery store, I don't go. I don't start thinking, I hate beets. Beets, they're the worst thing. They're horrible. I actually don't think about beets. And that's pretty normal. When you don't like something, you just don't think about it. But when you excessively don't like it, when you have an emotional connection with the thing you don't like, then you think about it, right? So brahmachari, Ideally, doesn't think about women. 
in, in any form or any way, whether good or bad or whatever. It's just it's not you know, just if you're actually not attached to something, you don't think good about it, bad about it. You may think bad about it sometimes, but generally you don't think about it. And generally, if you're really detached, then you, you're just neutral. It's like, I have no need for this. So, Anandita, the person who is speaking ex uh, who's for, what did you say? Excessively adverse? I've lost the... We well, got pushed down a bit. Um, excessive aversion. Generally, if the excessively adverse person is a devotee, it can, can be, well, let's just say it can be a tactic to, de to try to detach them through gyan, through knowledge. Like, Let's say I'm attached to something, but I don't want to be attached to it. <clears throat> so here's a pizza. My favorite food is a pizza. And I eat way too much pizza, and I'm way overweight, and I'm not healthy. And how, what am I going to do? So I have, to, if I can become adverse to pizza and start thinking, pizza's bad for me, it's horrible, and have big pictures of myself fat all over my house so I can see how fat and ugly I am from eating pizza. If I can develop an aversion, yeah, then I might be able to stop eating pizza. So it's an aversion through knowledge. <clears throat> it's not an aversion through rasa, through taste. Now that I'm eating dal rice, japatis, and sabji, I've been able to control my pizza eating to once a week because that's rasa. But otherwise, I have to try to control it by reminding myself of how pizza is really bad and it's really horrible. I don't believe it because I love it. But if I say it enough and convince myself, I mean, it is bad for me. It's not as healthy as dal rice and chapatis, all that cheese and this and that. And white flour. So that's why I do that excess. Generally, the excessive aversion is when done by a devotee is to just it's done as a tactic to retain, remain renounced, but it's not, it's a good temporary measure, but it's not really healthy. And if an ordinary person is excessively detached, it could, it, a verse, it could be the same thing. Or there could just be something wrong with them. That, you know, they're very, you know, some people are like, you ever see, they just react like they're very dramatic. So, you know, it's like, beats, ah! I see a beat and, you know, I'm fainting, you know. But some people are like that, you know, when they see something they don't like, it's like, they just have very adverse reactions. So that may be some, like, psychological thing, traumatized by beats in a former life or something. Maybe I was forced to eat beets in a former life, like my mother made me eat too many beets. Now I don't like them, or you know, someone threw a beet at me and knocked me out. Who knows? Traumatized by beets. Okay, that's the name of this lecture, right? Everyone will definitely understand what that means. Okay. Gopinath Felipe Martinez Nicolas says, you know when you're from South America, you have to have many names. And you know when you're a disciple of Jab Takamaraj, you have to have many names because he has so many disciples. Unless he puts a few names together, they'll never come up with that many names. That's why you know, once, when you ask someone what's your name and says, well, my name is Sundari, Radhika, Madhuri, Leela, Gopi, Priya, Devi, Dutch, you go, oh, Jab Takamaraj. And they go, how did you know? Oh, I just guessed. Um, okay. When I am able to resist the temptation for sense gratification, how do I stop honoring myself for not doing it? I think you should honor yourself. I think you should go, yes, Gopinath, you're the best. You're the best. I think we should, actually. I think you should celebrate when you control yourself. You know why? Because 
if you celebrate it, it'll inspire you to do it again. If, you know, it's not, it's not that pride is bad if you become proud of doing something. So you go, Krishna consciousness, it's amazing. Krishna, thank you. We did it. So, you know, just, just use we instead of me. It's Krishna, we did it. I feel so good. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for helping me. So, you know, there is a, a place for pride. I think there is also a healthy place for being proud of yourself without becoming puffed up. You know, I just like, I did it, yeah. You know, give yourself a pat on the back. You know, I I was tempted and I didn't do it. Yeah, keep, keep up the good work, Mahatma. Yeah, like that. I think it's okay. As long as you don't, you see, there's a kind of pride which can empower you. It's not the pride that makes you think, you know, um, I controlled myself today, which definitely means I'm the best devotee in Chile, at least in Santiago. So when you start thinking like that, then it's a problem. But if you think, I controlled myself, I'm proud of myself, and you're saying, Gopinath, we did it. We can do this again. That's good. But it's not, you don't think, oh, I'm the best devotee now. Then it's okay. That pride is good. Let's give a big hand to Gopinath. He did it. Just don't become puffed up, Gopinath. And keep up the good work. Okay, Kriste says, why the process of cleansing the heart from sense gratification is so emotionally heavy on a conditioned soul? Is it like that for everyone? Um, to one degree or another. Because... Um, yeah. Well, it's heavy, it's, it's hardest when you're trying to give it up without being able to replace it with some higher taste in Krishna consciousness because you feel an absence of something. It's much easier when you're feeling ecstasy in Krishna consciousness then you won't feel an absence. Because if, if you're not feeling it in Krishna consciousness and you give it up materially, then what do you have left? You have nothing. And so naturally you're going to feel like this is really, really difficult. Or it's your comfort zone. It's all you know. This was like, you know, this was, this was my life, right? Like for me, when I turned... I think 13, I got my first guitar, and it was love at first sight, although it was a really bad guitar. But I tolerated the bad guitar. And at that age, I was writing songs. No one taught me how to write songs. I just liked to do it. And I was playing guitar. And from my memory, I don't think from the age of 13 till I became a devotee, there was a day where I didn't play guitar for at least a couple hours. Or if I couldn't because I was traveling somewhere or camping, that I didn't think about playing it for a couple hours. But I would say most likely 360 days a year plus I played. And I remember, you know, becoming a devotee thinking, well, there's no real use for the guitar now. And I'll just give it to the temple and they can sell it. But I remember that for me during those years growing up, the guitar was like an arm to my body. That's how I actually felt that way. I remember specifically feeling that because when I finally gave it up, I thought, this is amazing. It's like I'm giving up an arm for Krishna's service. And it was, you know, it was like, it was so part, it was such a big part of me. But it was a little easier, I think, for me than for other devotees to give up those other things that were part of them because I was living in a temple doing Harinam Sankirtan, um, maybe from like 10 to 1 and then like 2 to 6 every day. And then sometimes 8 to 9 again in the evening or 7.30 to 8.30, like a lot. So we were pretty absorbed. And so I wasn't feeling that lack. So I had mentioned this in another class, which is a very important point. It's actually a bit dangerous to give up something if you can't replace it because it may make you crazy. 
at the same time, we're asked to give up certain things. So what I was explaining the other day in class, I think maybe it was this class. I, I give a lot of classes and I don't remember exactly who I explained it to. It might have been to you. But I was saying it's, it's a little dangerous to give up sense gratification if you don't replace it with something. Because often when you give up something, as you know, the desire for it becomes stronger, isn't it? Okay, this week don't eat any pizza. So by next week, your desire for pizza is stronger than ever because you haven't had any. So that was, that's what can happen in Krishna consciousness because you're giving up something. The things you're giving up become more attractive than they ever were for you because you're giving them up unless it's being replaced by something better. So yes, you could go crazy. I don't know if you ever had this experience. Have you ever had this experience where you're like really hungry and then the prasadam is like either there's not enough or there's only like one thing left or the prasadam was was burnt or too much salt or it just it didn't satisfy you? And like the whole day you're like in anxiety, you know, because it wasn't satisfying. You ever have that experience? Like you're just your mind's disturbed because the prasadam, it didn't satisfy. There's only one thing left. All that was left was some rice. And that's all what I had for lunch. And it's like I'm my mind is not peaceful. So the conditioned soul needs a sufficient amount of sense gratification just to be okay. You know, what happens when you don't get enough sleep, right? <clears throat> you ever been around someone who didn't get enough sleep? Uh, yeah, sometimes they can get really, really nasty, isn't it? So we have to have sufficient sense gratification. Sufficient means enough to be peaceful. And if we're going to give up something that's very dear to us and not go crazy, we have to be able to replace it with with a deeper absorption in Krishna consciousness. And if we can't replace it, then we have to use it in Krishna's service. Now here's another thing that's happened, Kriste, to many devotees. Um, I have a god brother. Well, he's not a god brother, but he's almost like god brother. He's very... I think he joined in like 78. And when he was living in Alachua, I don't know now, but when he was living in Alachua, he had 18 guitars and I think two basses and a couple amps. And you might think, hmm, that's a lot of guitars. That is, and probably he had tons of guitars before he was a devotee, and probably when he became a devotee, he just sold them or donated them. And so, and he was a happy brahmachari doing book distribution. And if you ask him, he'll probably say, yeah, I was happy brahmachari doing book distribution. But then, you know, at a certain stage, 40 or 50, and it, it happens to many devotees, these tendencies, which the things they gave up, they realized that, well, actually, they're strong tendencies. But now they're more mature in Krishna consciousness and they know how to use them in Krishna's service without really being bewildered by them or overly attached by them. You know, so, you know I really realize that music is really important for me. I really realize that cooking is really important for me or whatever. Is really, you know, acting is really, you know, I used to act before as a devotee. And then, I, you know, I went on Sankirtan for 10 years. I loved it and this and that. And then, you know, I turned like 45 and somehow I realized that this desire to act is like, I can't control it. So sometimes it happens like that. And you come back in a more mature state and then you can use it with that. But when you're a younger devotee, you couldn't do it. Because, you know, it's like I gave the guitar. It's like, I don't need this guitar. I'm just, just sitting around the temple. I'll just play Baby, I Love You. So just better they sell it and use the money. Although now I lament because one guitar I had, if I were to buy it today, would cost $2,500. I was in London two years ago and I saw that guitar, I think used in a guitar shop. And it was like 2,300 pounds or something, which was like $2,700. I'm like, ah, I gave that guitar away. It's worth $2,700. That was the stupidest thing I ever did. But at the time, it was like, yeah, Krishna, take it. You know, happy. 
So sense gratification, Chris Day, we all need nice prasadam. We need sufficient sleep. We need a roof over our head. Uh, we need friends. We need service. That's inspiring. And if we, you know, like here's another example. Now, this is a common example. I don't know today if this is such an example, but um, women will join ISKCON and then they'll just be extremely austere. They'll wear a white sari with a blue border and they'll have like three of those and that's all they have and like one pair of shoes and like, and you know, they just you know, get up, they don't really comb their hair that much. They don't, they're just like going austere and they almost become like men. And then at some point in their devotional service, they realize that they kind of became a man. They just gave up their feminine side. And so that's not healthy. So, but, ba you know, balance, not like, you know, you spend an hour before Mangal Arti choosing your sari, choosing your choli, putting on makeup, choosing which, which of 50 pairs of shoes you're going to have. Okay, that's the other extreme. So, you know, you can't give up everything and and all of us can give up to different degrees and different desires. So if you're going crazy, 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 maybe you've given up too much too fast or maybe you're not absorbed enough in Krishna consciousness to get the taste that's necessary to empower you to be able to give it up. So that's one answer. There could be more because when you use this word emotionally heavy on the conditioned soul, that opens up a whole other discussion. So this kind of touched the surface, but um, there is an emotional connection to sense gratification because that's, this is what we've had all our life, right? And you can't avoid it, but it doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it has to be used. Things that you like, they give you sensual pleasure. You like them. Can you use them for Krishna without them devouring you? And in some cases, the answer is yes, I can use this for Krishna. In some cases, the answer is no, I can't. Um, I knew this one devotee. He was a he had a PhD, I think, in physics, <clears throat> and he never wanted to like join the Bhaktivedanta Institute. He just wanted to go out and distribute books. He goes, I don't want to do that. And I think the reason he didn't want to do it is, is, is he felt like he could be distracted by it. He, like, he likes it so much. You know, and I like, I, I just rather distribute book distribution. If I do that, I'll just like do it all day and, you know, I'll stop reading and I'll think about it when I chant my rounds. <clears throat> and that was... He told me that about 40 years ago. No, 45 years ago. And about five years ago, I saw him in India, and he's writing all these scientific books now. So sometimes it evolves that way, that it's just, it's like an emotional thing. I don't want to do this, you know. If I, if I do the science, it'll just bring back all these memories and kind of, and, and, you know, if I play the guitar now, I'm a new devotee, it's just, you know, I'll be thinking about, the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and this it's just like okay I'll play Merdunga that's just it's simpler but you know 50 years later oh I have an idea I want to do this song you know Brahma Samhita you know devotees like it we'll do a new version so you know we'll play the guitar you know it's different it's, you're just totally in the mood of service because you've matured and now it's like oh I could use this so let me use this oh now I can use physics I can see how I can use it okay no, not, it's not a problem anymore. I just want to use this for service. So, yeah, it's a good question. I hope that answered it to one degree or another. Now, all of you have to figure practically what you need. Um, there's one other thing we talked about long, long ago was that your zero point, like how much sense gratification do you need to come to zero? The zero point is the point where you're like, okay, now I'm okay. I ate enough, now I'm okay. I don't need to eat more than that. Beyond the, beyond the zero point, it's sense gratification. Up to the zero point, <clears throat> it's good. Now I can do my service. Below the zero point, you're going to be thinking about eating more. Have you ever not eaten enough? And like, a, and like you, 10 minutes later, you're thinking about food. So that's not good. 
and you know you've eaten too much, and 10 minutes later you're thinking about sleeping. Correct? Correct. So your zero point uh, in eating is a good example for your zero. What's your zero point of sense gratification? Yeah, so, well, these, this is what I need. I need A, B, C, and then I'm fine. I can think about Krishna. But if I don't have A, B, and C, I'm going to be thinking about A, B, and C. But if I add D, E, and F to it, then it's going to deviate me. I don't need D, E, and F. And then it's, it's too much. And it's not good for my Krishna consciousness. It's just a deviation. It wastes time. So you have to understand your zero point. And so, yeah, if you don't get to your zero point, you could go crazy. If you go over your zero point, you could go crazy. And like I say, when you're mature and you can engage things that you renounced before because you couldn't engage them, that doesn't take you over your zero point. That's just service. Prabhu, you know, we have this scientific symposium. Can you speak at it? Okay, I'll speak. Ask him 45 years ago. I'm not going to speak. I don't want to touch this stuff. I gave this all up. So a lot of young devotees are like that. I give it up. I don't want to touch it. Or the other devotees, how can I give it up? It's too much. All right. So the, the point is, can you engage that sense gratification? That attack? Can you engage it without it destroying you? That's the point. And if so, how? And as you become, you know, or can I? Okay, for me, the way it worked is, okay, no guitar, but there's harmonium and bedunga. And I was like, okay, harmonium and bedunga is music. I like music. I can't live without music. Harmonium and bedunga, a replaced guitar. Okay, I was fine. I never like sold my guitar. Okay, but there was the harmonium and bedunga. And it was like, that's, these are my new instruments. So it made the transfer. So yeah, if you took, I, I would sometimes imagine and say, if I joined ISKCON, and there was no music, how would I deal with it? And I'd think, I would be crazy. I would go crazy. I would like run out at midnight from the Brahmacharya ashram, you know. I would, I would, or I would sneak out, you know, off Harinam. I would disappear and say, I have to go to the bathroom. And I'd disappear into the music store and play the guitar, you know, for 10 minutes. i go, okay, I got my fix. I'm all right. Now I can go back. Um, if, if there was no music, I would go crazy. What if marriage wasn't allowed? In Iskon, <clears throat> how many men would go crazy? A lot. So yes, what you say is true. You could, if you, if you're below the zero point, you could go crazy, and we definitely would go crazy. I could think of so many musicians who would go completely nutty if music were not a part of Krishna. I know so many girls, especially here in Alachua, the girls all grow up learning Bharat Natyam, and they love it, and they travel with Rathyatra, and. If they couldn't dance, they'd, I don't know, they'd kill somebody. Not actually kill somebody, but they'd kill something. They'd destroy. They would go crazy, for sure. Um, so you can see, you know, so you can see we need these things. And it's true. You could have an emotional problem on some level. So you have to engage it, right? So I engage my musical propensity with harmonium and redunga. If, because at that point, you know, although we play guitar and kirtan, I was like, no need. So you like to dance, you could learn Bhart Natyam, dance in the kirtan, you could learn Odissi, you could learn this and that. <clears throat> I like sang I like to act, and that's why I like Sankirtan. I, I could act, I could be funny with people. Introverts, they have a hard time on Sankirtan. I, I have an introverted side, I have an extroverted side. And it allowed me to manifest the extroverted side. And I, I like to act. And that's what I did. So I didn't feel a need like I had to go, you know, do dramas in the temple. I just go on Sankirtan. Hey! You know, and I'd say, you know, you just joke with people and act, you know. And I go, and I'd ask for a donation. And I'd say, and today, it's your lucky day. And they go, why? I said, because you get to give it a, you get to give it a donation. And when you give a donation, it goes around, comes around. It's amazing what's going on. It's your lucky day. Congratulations. You know, I would do things like that. And that was just, it was natural for me. And so whatever tendency I had for acting, I used it. So I thought that was an important question, which is why I took so much time to answer it, in case you're wondering 
Why is he taking so much time? So I think it's an important question. Isn't it? Uh, Deva Smita says, I can make devotees just by telling them they're going to become devotees. I, I didn't know I had that potency, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it on somebody. Dr. Mai says, I used to need one hour before Mangal Arctic not to put on makeup, but to manage to put on the sari. Ah! That is where I realized why in India they all live together. There's always someone to help you drape the sari. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. 108% to the point. You mentioned every thought that ran through my head last week. Okay. That's good. Shamanandidi says, I observe that due to circumstances, we may not have the ideal KC engagement or activities, yet we continue to try our best to practice devotional service. In those situations, it is good to encourage ourselves for continuing being a devotee, although it may not be ideal uh, KC situation we desire. Encouraging ourselves could be beneficial for our own good and our KC project. Yes. Good job, Shamanandini. Yeah, encourage yourself. We have to, you know. I mean, if you don't encourage yourself, what are you going to do to yourself? Discourage yourself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's okay to encourage yourself. It's way better than discouraging yourself. Which we often are very good at, aren't we? And um, you can also find service that inspires you. That's also another way to encourage yourself. Not only encourage yourself that I'm... And encourage it in the service, even though it's not the ideal. But, you know, also find the, see if you can engage in the ideal. That bird agrees. You hear that bird? He, agree, he agrees. Okay. Chris Day says, I found lectures on a concept, spiritual schizophrenia, which could happen if one does the things you mentioned, not replacing what you let go. Was that my lecture or someone else's? If it's someone else's, I'd love to hear it. I think this class should be included in the Bhakta courses. <clears throat> oh, about sense gratification. Uh -huh. Oh, so Christy says that's what she did last week. She dove into the Madanga. Brian says, Sydney says she cannot be here. Uh, her son is in surgery. Sorry to hear that. Okay, we have eight minutes, so we can read some more. This is from the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Teachings of Lord Chaitanya is a summary study of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, just as Krishna book is a summary study of Srimad Bhagavatam. The manifestation of Krishna's internal potency, yoga maya, or if you're Bengali, yoga, 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 yogurt. Prabhu, you want some yogurt? Yoga maya is not exhibited in the part of the. Oh, we've read that. No, we didn't read that. It's just a. It's explaining the same point. The manifestation of Krishna's internal potency, yoga maya, is not exhibited in the part of the kingdom of God comprising the Vaikuntha planets. But Krishna does exhibit the internal potency within the universe when he descends from his personal abode out of his inconceivable mercy. Krishna is so wonderful and attractive that he himself becomes attracted by his own beauty. And this is proof that he is full of all conceivable, inconceivable potencies. Now, this is, this is an interesting point you may have heard, but I, find, I just wanted to include this. As far as the ornaments decorating Krishna's body are concerned, it appears that they do not beautify him, but that they themselves become beautiful simply by being on his body. Hmm. So if, if Krishna is wearing jewelry and you think, that jewelry is so beautiful... Now you know why. 
because it was probably not that beautiful, as beautiful before it was put on his body. Always standing in a three-curved way, he attracts all living entities, including the demigods. Indeed, he even attracts the Narayan form who presides in every Vaikuntha planet. <clears throat> That's from the teachings of Lachitana, chapter 10, entitled The Beauty of Krishna. So we have a little time. You can read some more. That was just a confirmation again that the Yogamaya potency <clears throat> is not necessary and necessary in Vaikuntha. And that Yogamaya potency descends where with Krishna to Braj from Goloka. So this is from Krishna book chapter two. Thus ordered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Yoga Maya circumambulated the Lord and then appeared within this material world according to his order. With Yoga Maya, the supreme power of the supreme powerful personality of Godhead, transferred Lord Sesha from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini, both Devaki and Rohini were under Yoga Maya's spell, which is called Yoga Nidra. When this was done, people thought that Devaki's seventh pregnancy had been a miscarriage. Thus, although Balaram appeared as the son of Devaki, he was transferred to the womb of Rohini to appear as her son. After this arrangement, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, who was always ready to protect his unalloyed devotees, entered within the mind of Basudev as the Lord of the whole creation, with full inconceivable potencies. It is understood in this connection that Lord Krishna, first of all, situated himself in the unalloyed heart of Vasudev and was then transferred to the heart of Devaki. He was not put into the womb of Devaki by seminal discharge. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, by his inconceivable potency, can appear in any way. It is not necessary for him to appear in the ordinary way, by seminal injection within the womb of a woman. Of course he can appear any way. If you were God, would you like hang out in the womb and get appear like an ordinary child? Probably not. You'd figure a better way to appear, right? So again, we're reading how Krishna said, Yoga Maya, I need you. You to come to the material world. I need you to help. Um, and so, Yoga Maya, as we had discussed, she, she does so many things that Krishna wants. Krishna has nine principal energies, and Yoga Maya is one of them. And But we're focused on Yoga Maya because she has an uh, amazing uh, position in the Leela of Krishna. And, and it's interesting because here, as we know the story, Balaram is preparing the womb and then he's going to take birth in the, as the son of Rohini, who is the Rohini is the wife of Vasudev, the brother-in-law of Kanks of uh, Nandamaraj. So this is all being arranged by Yogamaya, so that's why Krishna, you know, Yogamaya is kind of like, you know that person? like a, uh, the CEO or the king or something, just has that person that you just tell that person, this is what's to be done, and you don't have to worry about it. That's yoga mind. I need a yoga mind also. I have too much to do. I need that person I can just say, this, 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 get it done. There are people that have their own yoga mind. They, you know, they're so busy, they need someone to just say, you arrange this, arrange that. So that's that's her function like um like i said before like a producer in a movie so that's we've read all the quotes wow so we're finished sooner than i thought so tomorrow's the class in russian and then friday i will have a few more quotes i don't we're, i don't know if i'm going to find really find much more about yoga maya that we haven't already discussed if that's the case, you can suggest what the next topic should be. If no one suggests, then I will. If no one suggests, then I will.
choose the topic of the mind. Oh, it's a set of lectures by Rinda Superprabhu. Fantastic. Can you send me the link in my... Send me by email the link. I want to hear that. If you want to stimulize... Stimulize. That's not a word. It, maybe it is, but not a word I know of. If you want to stimulate your intellect, then you can listen to Rabindra Suru. If you're, you know, if you're an intellectual and your intellect is drying up and you need to fill it up, then you listen to his lectures. Some devotees are intellectuals and intellectualism for them is a form of gratification and they can gratify that amply in Krishna consciousness because there's so many intellectual things to discuss. But some devotees are intellectual. Vidandana Maharaj, that you can satisfy your intellect. You can satisfy... Um, and then there are other devotees who can satisfy you intellectually. They're very great scholars. Um, a lot of them are professors. Guruda, Radhika, Ramana. Yeah, they're like... And some devotees can satisfy you with Leela. Yeah, there's so many, you know. We're all different. We need different kinds of satisfaction. Okay. So, Manjari says, Manjari, it was amazing to know about that yoga maya is not powerful in the spiritual world, but it's such a Christian human. Yeah. Also, it's beneficial to use all material instrument of our interest when used in Krishna's service. If you don't use it for Krishna, you'll, you, you may use it for something. So either you don't use it because you're renounced, or you use it... You use it for Krishna. That's it. That was pretty simple. Okay. So, it's 9.30. We started late. Um, I was kind of under the weather, as we say, this morning. Kind of moving slow. So I was a little late. But we can stop on time. Thank you, everyone. Hare Krishna. We will see you tomorrow in Russia on Zoom. Also broadcast on Facebook. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <laughs>